Frederick Griffith, 1928, did the experiments that were the first evidence of bacterial transformation. He was working with the pathogen Streptococcus pneumoniae. which is a common cause of bacterial pneumonia. There was considerable interest in developing a vaccine against Streptococcus pneumoniae. And in order to do that, they needed to know more about the biology of the organism. One thing that had been worked out before Griffith started his work was that there were multiple types of Streptococcus pneumoniae, different strains. And the way that they found these out, they would take cells from a culture from one patient, say one of them is type 2. You take the type 2 cells and inject them into an animal, typically they used rabbits for this. Here we are, injecting into the rabbit. Inject type 2 cells into the rabbit. The rabbit develops an immune response. You extract serum from the rabbit, that is to say the liquid portion of the blood, that serum now contains antibodies against type 2 streptococcus. If you mix that serum with type 2 cells, the antibodies in the serum will bind to the cells. And what happens is a visible response as the cells clump up or agglutinate. Let's take a little sidebar here and, to, and think about how antibodies work. The antibody is a protein. Typically, antibody proteins are Y-shaped. They consist of four, uh, four subunits, two long chains, heavy chains like this, two smaller light chain subunits. These are held together by typically disulfide bridges, like so. And if you look at an antibody of a particular class, there are certain different types. There are cell-bound ones and circulating ones and so on. Within a class of antibodies, all of this portion of the antibody is constant. All the different antibodies you make, this part would be the same. Out here at the ends of this Y shape are the parts that are specific, and these are highly variable. So you can make antibodies that will bind to lots of different things. So these are the variable parts. Now, a given antibody like this has those two variable binding areas. They're the same in one antibody, and they bind to some substance that's foreign, that's not normally found in the body. We call a foreign substance like that an antigen. And that's the job of an antibody. An antibody binds to an antigen. So here's your bacterial cell. It's got a lot of compounds on the surface of it that aren't normally found in your body. Any of these could be an antigen. If you're making antibodies against those antigens, then the antibody, here's a Y-shaped antibody, binds to one of those antigens. It's got two binding sites. One of them's bound to this bacterial cell. This one can bind to the same antigen on another bacterial cell. But that bacterial cell has many copies of that antigen molecule another antibody can bind to it. And then that one can bind to another cell, another antibody is bind to it, and so on and so forth. The net result is that when the antibodies are present to bind to antigens on the surface of bacterial cells, they clump the bacterial cells together. They attach them together in a clumps. We call this phenomenon agglutination. And you can see this pretty easily. If you have a liquid culture of bacteria, you mix in some serum that contains antibodies against antigens on this bacteria, it goes from being a smooth distribution of you know, cloudy-looking liquid to being clumps of cells in a clear liquid. 
So you can see the agglutination response until right then if you've got antibodies for the particular antigens on the surface of those cells. This is the one we looked at. There are other, you take cells from another patient who has a different case of streptococcal pneumonia. We call these type 3 cells. Inject those into a rabbit. Take serum from that rabbit. Mix that serum with type 3 cells. And you'll get agglutination. Now, here's the deal. If you take serum from, that was raised from this rabbit that was inoculated with type 2 cells, which we might call anti-type 2 serum. If you take that serum and mix it with type 3 cells, you don't get any agglutination. If you take this serum, which was raised against type 3, mix that with type 2 cells, you don't get agglutination. The antibodies in the serum from the rabbit are specific to the particular type of cells, the particular strain of streptococcus. And this is really consistent. So that those, these strains, you raise type 2 cells in culture, many, many, many transfers, they're still type 2. Okay? And they're still going to only bind to the type 2 antibodies and not to the type 3 antibodies. Okay, Griffith knew all of this. This is background for him. Griffith discovered that if you took some of these cultures, culture of type 2 cells, for instance, and transferred them many times under certain conditions, every once in a while you would find a culture that was different from the others. The typical streptococcal culture is, look at it in a petri dish, you've got, you get these big sort of slimy looking blobby cultures on the cells form these smooth, shiny looking colonies because each cell is, has a polysaccharide coat, a coat of polysaccharide slime on the outside of it. And we refer to these as S for smooth colonies. These are the typical ones. What Griffith found was that every once in a while you'd get a culture where you'd get instead these little dry, rough looking colonies, R for rough, and these cells lack the polysaccharide slime on the outside of the cell. In fact, the polysaccharide slime has a protective effect. It protects the bacteria from the defenses of the organism so that these cells, the smooth ones, are virulent. They cause disease. The rough ones are non-virulent. Griffith was doing some experiments trying to look at how the rough cells arise, could the rough cells turn back into smooth cells, what, what was going on with that, what was the distinction between these and how was it maintained. So he tried some experiments with them. One thing that he did then was he took some type 2R cells, live 2R cells, and he injected them into mice. Our mouse injects some live 2R cells into the mouse. And when you do that, the mouse lives. This is because type, the rough type cells, the 2R cells, are not virulent. Okay? The mouse's immune response or whatever, all the defenses in the mouse, are able to deal with that. So the mouse lives, it doesn't get streptococcal pneumonia. Then he said, okay, if we had the S-type cells, you can heat kill those cells, and that won't cause disease. So he takes heat killed 3S cells, for instance. Take heat killed 3S cells, inject those into a mouse, and again, the mouse lives. What happens if you mix the two? Take live 2R cells and he killed 3S cells. And 
inject those into the mouse. In this case, the mouse dies. Not only does the mouse die, but if you then extract blood from the mouse and culture cells from it, what you find in that mouse are live 3S cells. And remember, you can tell 3S cells from 2S cells because you can take these and put anti-3S serum with them and it'll agglutinate them. So here's an example where this division into types or strains is not stable. And furthermore, somehow we're going from live 2R cells to live 3S cells. We're getting back the smooth the smooth nature of these, the polysaccharide coat, and we've changed the antigenic type from type 2 to type 3. Griffith referred to this phenomenon as transformation. Now, Griffith at the time thought that what was happening was that somehow the live 2R cells were picking up the polysaccharide coating from the dead 3S cells and incorporating it into those cells. Not a very good answer to this problem because if you take those 3S cells that came from those mice, you can keep culturing them more or less indefinitely and all of their descendants are type 3. So didn't look like didn't look like Griffith's answer to this was very good. We now understand transformation to mean that what's happened is that uh, a bacterial cell In this case, the live 2R cell is picking up DNA from the external environment DNA into its chromosome. Now, at this point, in 1928, of course, Griffith couldn't come up with this definition. We didn't know that DNA was the genetic material. In fact, experiments extending Griffith's work would be some of the very first experiments to provide evidence that DNA was, in fact, the genetic material.